This is Maureen Elward. You're listening to Backcast Cape Ann. The stories you hear as part of Backcast Cape Ann series on the LBGTQ community highlights their contribution, care, and activism. It's a look back at experiences, significant moments, and persistent memories. I'm here with Charles Nazarian, president of the Gloucester Meeting House Foundation. He's a resident of Bayview, a pipe organ designer, and an architectural designer. Charles, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Maureen. Well, Charles, you arrived uh, in Gloucester in 1975 to work at uh, Fisk, and you're an openly gay man. What was that like coming here at that time? It was a very interesting place to be. Um, I, like a lot of people in that period, had been active with uh, the gay liberation movement when I was uh, at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. As an undergrad, I helped found Trinity's uh, first gay liberation group. And uh, it was a very curious time, uh, all of the liberation movements coming together in the late 60s uh, on the heels of the civil rights movement, uh, all of these forces in play along with the Vietnam War and uh, the Nixon era, all of that stuff was very intense culturally. A lot of us, including myself, uh, who came out um, either as gay or lesbian uh, at that time, still had lots of family members who may or may not have known, some of whom we came out to, some of which we didn't. Um, parents who maybe could never go down that road of acceptance, others who were struggling. And coming to Cape Ann in some ways also put a little distance between me and the core of my family in the Boston area and elsewhere. And those uh, who I had taken into my confidence about my private life uh, were actually remarkably forward-thinking. And it took a while for the rest of the family to come along. But coming to Cape Inn, for me, as it has been, I think, for many people coming up Route 128, was a place of healing and a place of finding oneself. There's something about coming over that bridge that's very magical. Uh, Some people say that there's a crystal deposit under Cape Inn and that that buzz that we feel when we come over the bridge is actually some kind of healing energy. Uh, But I think there is great truth in the fact that people of all different kinds have come here, whether to seek, seeking to build their castle by the sea or simply finding a place by the ocean that is very beautiful and accessible, while still not being far away from Boston as a great cultural center. Those, that combination is very alluring, and it was for me. Charles Fisk used to say that we kind of had the best of both worlds here because you could go to the symphony and come home and then the next day be at the beach. And very few places in the country have that combination of quality of life and being in nature and yet being near a great metropolitan center. Boston, of course, was the place to party, uh, whether you were gay or straight, uh, compared to Cape Ann. But Cape Ann had a very interesting and long-standing history of uh, gay and lesbian people here, and gradually learning about that was very interesting for me at the time. How did you start learning about this? Where did it come about? Well, it happened in sort of dribs and drabs. Uh, I remember, for example, the first time that I toured the Hammond Castle, and I was lucky enough to have a docent who knew quite a bit of the inside story about Jack Hammond and his background. And as she took us through the house, she not only described all of the things to do with coats of mail and the various things that mostly had to do with the occult and uh, oftentimes with death, but she also hinted at his personal life. And if you scratch the surface just a little bit, you'll discover that even though Jack Hammond was married, it was quite well known in social circles that 
Um, he was a gay man, and he had a very cordial relationship with his wife, uh, and uh, they uh, were both into the occult. They shared a lot of interests, uh, but in many ways he was um, just a completely unique individual. But he was part of a circle here on Cape Ann of millionaire eccentrics, you might say. And touring the castle was sort of my first hint of um, who this group of people might have been. Hammond's story is really fascinating. His um, father actually owned the entire coastline from what was the Cardinal Cushing Villa at that time, but it had been the elder Hammond's house. It's now owned by Reverend Moon, um, all the way down to uh, Magnolia Harbor. And his father had made himself a very substantial fortune uh, probably through not very honorable means in the diamond trade in South Africa. And Hammond himself was one of four children, which it took me a while to put the pieces together, uh, but all four of them were either gay or lesbian from what I've been able to place together. His elder brother I know very little about, but the two sisters, uh, their lives are fairly well documented and one of them had a uh, lace collection and lived outside of New York City in White Plains, and her house is a museum. And the other sister lived on Dolliver's Neck and built a compound of four houses. And I slowly discovered more about her because um, Charles Fisk and Virginia Lee Fisk, uh, his second wife, bought one of those houses in the compound. And I discovered that uh, Jack Hammond's sister actually kept a women's militia there, trained them on the grounds, and actually offered them to the United States government during World War II, and the government declined her. Uh, but it was fascinating to find out about uh, this woman, and I met the architect of her compound, a woman who was uh, one of the few practicing architects in the 1930s in New England. Her name was Miss Raymond, that's how she liked to be known. And she designed this compound uh, with some very forward-looking features. She got uh, salvaged World War I oil containers and put them under a glass cover and created a solar heating system for the compound by heating glycol in these tanks and then using a heat exchanger in order to transmit the heat into the rest of the compound. That's innovation at a time when this wasn't even really Hardly an idea. even thought of, right. right. But Miss Raymond was a very forward-thinking person. Uh, I asked her about this. She was in her mid-80s when I met her, and she said it worked quite well, but the oil was so cheap by the time the 50s came along, they took it all apart because it, it just wasn't worth the trouble. What's the connection with Hammond and Sleeper and A. Pyatt, Andrew? Uh, these three gentlemen were uh, probably Gloucester's most illustrious um, wealthy gay men. Uh, Henry Sleeper, of course, was the interior designer for the DuPonts. Uh, he was responsible for their home, Winterthur, in which every room is done in another period style, and in perfectly correct period style. A. Pyatt Andrew was a local politician. He was known for his progressive viewpoints, and I have one of the posters from his house, Red Roof, um, in which he's described as a progressive Republican. And of course, this is the 1920s now that we're talking about. And uh, the Republicans at that time were considered more progressive in their thinking than the Democrats, the uh, party of Lincoln, et cetera, et cetera. So these three gentlemen um, were known for throwing big parties. They were also part of a larger group of people often referred to as the Boston Bohemians. 
And there's a wonderful book by a man named Douglas Shan Tucci by that name, and tells the story of many of these people, um, including uh, women like Cecilia Bowe and others, people of fashion and background and wealth, who partied up here on Cape Ann in the grand style. Jack Hammond was something of a mischievous character from things I've been able to glean. He made a lot of money um, by creating patents for uh, tube, uh, as you think of radio tube type technology that was used by the US government for defense and remote control purposes. And he kept a little remote control uh, submarine and liked to send it around the harbor and startle fishermen by bringing it up alongside <laughs> of their boats. Jack also, I believe from things I've read, was the first person to have a really powerful high fidelity system with large speakers. And he delighted in blasting music across Gloucester Harbor so that his friends on Eastern Point could hear it. He also used a system like that in his house. He had a, a very large pipe organ built into Hammond Castle, but the pipe work went up into the tower where much of it would not be audible from the Grand Hall. So he microphoned it and amplified it through his voice of the theater speakers. And that's all gone today, unfortunately, and the organ is in terrible disrepair. But he, he was a great mind when it came to electronics and things like that. He was brought as a young boy to meet um, Thomas Edison, and Edison kind of took him under his wing and encouraged him. Wow, what an opportunity to meet Thomas Edison and yes. is inspired by that. Yes. back to your experience when you got here in 1975. What was the gay community like? Was it easy to find? Did you know about it? It was not easy uh, if you didn't know anybody here. And it took me a little while. For example, uh, I dropped by uh, somebody who had a, an, an antique store and um, he was a, a very friendly guy, and I was looking at the stuff in his antique store. And it, my, what we like to call gaydar, sort of went on. And I started thinking, hmm, this seems very likely, but I couldn't really tell. But in the course of conversation, you start to find out that somebody has like interests um, or may mention somebody else who you've met who you might know their lifestyle. And it took a little while, but um, I got to know him very well, and later on, his partner. Uh, they had, for quite a long time, a wonderful place for uh, sandwiches and all kinds of great food, and they did a lot of catering work on Cape Ann, and they also threw some fabulous parties. And so through meeting just a few people initially, then I gradually met others. But going back to what I said at the beginning about Cape Ann, many of the gay men I met, and also gay women as well, were, if not already in couples, um, on their way to being coupled up. And a lot of them had met elsewhere, like in Boston or whatever, and then wanted to settle in and found Cape Ann to be a lovely place to have a house and whatever. That was, that's a pattern that I think still exists today. Uh, it's still not that easy socially to meet other people um, in the gay and lesbian community. Uh, there are easier ways, certainly. There are gatherings of folks these days, and it's much more open than it was in the 70s. But nevertheless, uh, I think this is sort of one of the themes of Cape Ann being a refuge and a sort of a quiet place in which to enjoy your life. Did you find it welcoming when you got here? And do you find that same sense of welcome here now? I found it very welcoming. There was a fellow, actually, 
who worked at the Fisk shop, whose name was Joe Grace, who was the former mayor of Gloucester. And after he retired, he uh, came uh, back to the workshop. But Joe told me early in my apprenticeship that people on the other side of Cape Ann would know my business before I knew it. And that turned out to be true on many occasions. Really? I would run into somebody who would say, oh, I hear you're going to such and such. And, and how did I that happen? I haven't gotten the invitation <laughs> yet. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's talk about one favorite story of yours. As, um, uh, well, one particularly favorite story is about um, going to Rocky Neck. Uh, Rocky Neck was... The, really the only place in Gloucester where you could go on a, um, particularly on a weekend evening, and um, have a likely chance of meeting um, especially other gay guys who used to hang out at a couple of uh, different uh, watering halls. Uh, the studio was one of them, and its piano bar was very popular. However, at the time, there was a place called the Rockaway Hotel, the Rockaway is now condominiums, and it had started already to start to go downhill. It was one of those old hotels that had seen better days. But the Rockaway was a lot of fun, and there was an upstairs bar and a downstairs bar. The upstairs bar was probably the more polite of the two. The downstairs was a little more raucous, and there was one evening I went there, and a... Um, buzz sort of started in the room that somebody was arriving by boat and gradually um, we became aware that this guy arrived, came through the door, and he had somebody with him who at first you might have thought was a woman who had her hair up in a bun, but it clearly became obvious that this was somebody in drag, but a pretty good drag. Um, and that alone was kind of unusual. There were a couple of people on Rocky Neck who might, on occasion for something like the Beaux-Arts Ball, show up in drag, but it was not something one generally saw. And that particular evening, um, Harry Chapin was the uh, singer. And this was before Harry Chapin became a nationally recognized musician. And this guy came in, they got drinks, and uh, about 15 minutes went by or so, and this guy stood up and challenged Harry Chapin to a duel, a musical duel. And he challenged him to sing something in iambic pentameter. And if he would do that, he would return with another verse that was even more body. And so Chapin started out with a perfectly humorous and slightly naughty song in da dum 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 all in perfectly good iambic pentameter. Edward Albee got up and gave him one back a little dirtier. And then Harry Chapin came back with another one that was a little dirtier still. And this went on for about half an hour. And by the time Albie was finished, we were in the gutter, <laughs> without a doubt. <laughs> but it was the kind of thing that would never happen in a typical Boston bar. Um, and why did it happen up here? Well, I think part of it is the fact that Cape Ann has this illustrious history of artists and artisans and writers who have come here and um, either painted or written or done wonderful things. You know, we have this long, long history of incredibly talented people in the arts of all kinds, some of whom were gay, some of whom were straight. It is kind of an environment that invited somebody like Edward Albee to show up and do something like this. And um, it was delightful uh, for, you know, people there. There are also, in the 70s, enough older gay men and women here to know the history of the place. And I was lucky to meet some of them so that even though I might have been in my mid to late 20s at that point, 
I met a number of people who were in their 60s who could fill me in. That must have been great to have those conversations yeah. and that, that oral history passed down between And that's the only folks. way it would typically happen. Right. Uh, uh, there's a lot of this oral history which is still not really well recorded. Some of it, because people don't necessarily want the history to be known, um, coming back to Jack Hammond for a second, I found out over the years, and it took a little while, that he had a favorite young man in his life. And he actually built this young man um, uh, quite a remarkable smaller version of the Hammond Castle up on a hill uh, above Freshwater Cove. I was in, he was a young English actor. His last name was Buswell. Well, I think Mr. Buswell uh, today we would consider bisexual. And he eventually married and had kids. And his family did not want this story to come out. I don't think I really became fully aware of this story until the late 80s or early 90s when two guys from New York bought the castle known as Stillington Hall, and they opened it up for um, parties because there is actually a theater built into a, a separate building there they had musical soirees and all kinds of stuff. And then some of us started to become aware of Jack Hammond's connection to Buswell and the whole history that had gone down. But we otherwise probably would never have known. You're like the gay historian for gay fans. Well, I think there are others who have <laughs> quite a few good stories and probably know a lot of the historical facts, too. <laughs> We've also lost some of those people who I met uh, over the years, some of them to AIDS um, during that really, really tough period. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your work during that time. It was a very, very dark period in our history. Uh, I think for the country as a whole, uh, for all of the awful things that happened, um, I don't have to recite many of them, but you know, the orange juice queen who <laughs> was not very good to the uh, gay community. Uh, at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, it was very poorly understood. It was sometimes called the gay plague or the gay cancer. Uh, people just really had no idea of what was going on, but people were dying really fast. For me, uh, the personal experiences, I think, were the hardest, and I think that was true for most gay men, losing best friends and that sort of thing. Uh, I didn't work with a specific group of people, but I worked with individuals who were close friends and did my best to be there for them. One in particular was a guy who had been on the football team at Boston College. If you had met him, you would have thought he was the butchest guy you ever saw, and he he lived in Brookline, and I made him a promise that when the time came that I would be with him. It's one of the more difficult memories I have because uh, I saw him on and off and watched him going downhill, but he was hanging in, and then I got a call one day, and I rushed down uh, to his place. There was a hospice worker there. His brothers were all outside of the house, but they were unwilling to go in. And uh, he was at a point of having lost his awareness uh, to a point, but I knew that he could still hear me from the way he was reacting. And I think he was aware that his family had been nearby, but it was very hard to know exactly. But I... Um, stayed with him till his last breath, as I had promised to do. And I remember going outside afterwards, and uh, one of his brothers came up to me and thanked me. And I said, you know, you could have been there. And he looked at me and he said, no, we couldn't have done that. We just couldn't have been close to him at that moment. And it was really shocking to me. It was a real eye-opener that the fear level 
Um, the lack of knowledge, obviously, of being fearful that they might have caught it from him just by being close to him, which wouldn't happen. But also the fact that his own siblings had not in all that time been able to find their way to being with their brother really blew me away. I've never forgotten it because it was a signal that the disease itself was horrific, but what it did to families was also horrific. On the other side of that coin, I think it forced the hand of our society as a whole to come to a level of honesty about alternative lifestyles that would not have happened. And one can't say that even a single death is a good thing. I would never say that. But the whole experience for the culture as a whole, I believe, has led directly uh, to the acceptance of not only gay, lesbian, transgender people to the degree we have today, certainly um, the gay marriage movement, and also the interpersonal acceptance that you see with more families, with members of a family who just don't necessarily fit into the typical mode, whatever it is. That has changed enormously in the past 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think for those of us who lost so many friends, uh, um, in some ways, they were, um, they were martyrs to a cause. Going back to the, the gay liberation days, uh, at that point in time, uh, you were oftentimes asked to identify yourself. And I went to a meeting. What does that mean? Um, well, to identify yourself as being gay or straight, to, and to use that as a definition of who you are. And I think early on, a lot of people started realizing that that was rather limiting. And I went to a meeting in which um, somebody just got up and said, I am not a homosexual, and then waited for everybody to sort of gasp, and they did. And then his next sentence was, I am a homosexual human being. And I think one of the things that's happened that is I'm so glad of is that people realize that your sexual orientation is an adjective. It's not a noun. <laughs> And um, you may be um, a human being with a wide group of characteristics that are adjectives, but you are still a human being, first and foremost. And that awareness, I think, is also one of the great things. In my own family, for example, right now, there's a 20-something young man who in his early teens developed a great interest in cooking and um, things that were artistic. And his family, being very open-minded, have been waiting for years for him to come out <laughs> because they assumed he was probably gay. He's also a great athlete, and he's never come out to any of us, and I'm not sure that he is gay. I think he's just a very sensitive guy, and he may turn out that he's as heterosexual <laughs> as can be, but he's not playing that card one way or the other at the moment. And I, it's kind of ironic, his grandmother and his parents would all love for him to, ta for him to say, I'm thus and such, so that they can be supportive. But they're left in this limbo because He's not willing to define himself. And that right not to define yourself is very important, unless you want to. Uh, and that's a kind of freedom that we only dreamt about in the 70s and 80s. And it's something that kids today, I hope, the society won't go back on that. I, I hope that that will remain ingrained in the society. There are certainly people who would like to turn the clock back. <laughs>
and push people back into the closet and everything else. But I think the genie's out of the bottle. Charles, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for asking me. It's been a pleasure to listen to your stories and, and, and hear your thoughts. Backcast Cape Ann is a production of 1623 Studios. This show was produced by me, Maureen Elward, with technical assistance from Becky Tober. Find Backcast Cape Ann on 1623 Studios' Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find all our podcast episodes on 1623studios.org.